little bit more detail about what's involved, especially given the level of interest and the fact that this is a central tradition of use, okay? Okay, so um, I noted yesterday that uh, each, uh, that within particle filtering, as befits the name, each sample is, is represented uh, by a particle. Um, uh, each particle represents some hypothesis for the current situation. It's associated with, a, with an assumption about each successive element of model state. It assumes a particular specific value right now for this stock or that stock. In other words, that element of state, that element of state, et cetera. Okay? Um, and hence, it's associated, you could say, with a copy of model state. This is going to be an important point when you come to, to talk about particle filtering for, for agent-based models. Um, it's also associated with a weight, which varies between zero and one. That weight reflects its kind of its consistency thus far in anticipating data. And this is survival of the fittest, whereby the particles that are most competitive in terms of explaining the data observed from the world flourish, and those that are least competitive tend to die out. Okay, and the weight is the mechanism by which we achieve that, by the principles of sequential importance sampling. Okay, so each particle, for example, in a model, uh, model like this is going to have a particular value for each of these. And indeed, in that, in that um, uh, model that we were just exploring, as we noted, there's a, um, there's a particular stance, a particular value posited by this model for by each particle for susceptible, for exposure, by, for infectious, recovered, and each of these guys. That's why they're subscripted by particle at a technical level. That's a separate version of it for each particle. Okay. And uh, that particle um, has this kind of view of the world whose, whose accuracy we're testing in the crucible of empirical evidence. Okay. Um, okay. So there's basically two dynamic, two, two modes of be of evolution associated with these particles, and I distinguished them before in response to a question, but I want to emphasize it. So each particle has a full copy, as we said, of model state. And between observations, the particles simply evolve according to the logic of the model. So. The logic of the model says susceptible people can get infected and, and body infective people and those who are, when they get infected, they go into exposed and go from go to exposed to infected and eventually infected people recover, et cetera. And so between the observations, between when new data comes in, each particle, its behavior is governed by those rules. Much like if I went out to the bridge and I threw a piece of wood into the river, it would swirl along according to the, to the logic of the river. Okay? Um, during this time, between observations, there's no filtering out of particles. Particle weights remain the same. These are, these are samples from the prior distribution, uh, prior to the to the next observation um, at different points of time uh, given all the previous observations. Okay? Um, and it's completely well defined, despite what certain committee members may have asked about. Um, it's completely well defined mathematically. Um, at observation points is where the other action happens. Before that, it's just like the models being run with, a, say, with a thousand particles, with a thousand layers, each trundling along in its own solitude of a way, uh, blissfully unaware of the others. Okay? Between observations. At the time of the observation, now there's the rub. That's, that's when things start to happen. Okay? So here, particle weights are updated. The value of the particle is not updated. The values, what it posits about a given particle po posits about the world, is not itself updated. But the weight associated with this is updated to reflect 
how well it accords with what's observed from the world. Again, I said it gets upweighted, it's multiplied, its weight is increased if it accords well with something in the world, um, and its weight is decreased if it doesn't agree well with what's in the world, okay? Um, and that's an oversimplification, as, as often these descriptions are, because what the weight is changed and then the weights are normalized. Um, so if other particles are also very competitive, um, uh, my weight may not go up as much, etc. Okay, now, if there's too much disparity in weights between particles, the particles are resampled. Meaning there's a multinomial resampling, meaning basically we, the particles that are high weight multiply and the particles that are low weight disappear. What really happens is, okay, so we've taken into account the new data, we have the updated weights. There are some with high, some with low, and what happens is we blindly pick from those particles according to their weight, okay? We, um, to pick our new set of particles, we, we just clone the old ones, uh, having picked one, clone one we pick randomly with a probability according to its weight. So. The particle, one particle is weighed twice as big as another particle, there's twice the chance to be picked in that. We're just picking it according to its weight. It's, uh, um, it's a very simple process, uh, and uh, we, we just select one uh, with a probability according to its weights uh, for each position in the particle. So what was, and this is an important point, what was it, at, in, at what was particle three before, may get cloned into being particle 200 and you know 132 um, but position 3 is now taken by another particle that got cloned okay and some particles don't get picked at all and they disappear Great question. The weight represents an accumulated judgment of its response, not only to the most recent observation, but previous ones. So when, when I say that we see an observation and ones that are really good in their prediction, um, they're upweighted, okay? So meaning their weight is increased, but it's increased relative to their old weight, which re itself reflected how well they did previously, okay? So, um, and then uh, uh, if it's if its particle is not if that particle is not so uh, so good in its in its prediction this time it gets dinged maybe its weight will be reduced by a factor of you know 25 percent but maybe it was already a strong one because previously it had done really well and so the weight kind of reflects the cumulative matching of that particle not only on the most recent time but in previous times now. It's, it's more complicated than that because at time of resampling, where we pick them, we actually reset their weights to one. It's just that the ones that had high weights are much more likely to be survive, and then they're all treated as equal from then on, which is, is kind of an interesting subtlety, but, but, um, uh, but it still retains this basic feature that if it was really good in the past, it was just off in the latest one or two, it'll still be very competitive probably weight wise and, and it will get duplicated, it will get replicated, okay. Is that helpful? Yes. Okay. Um, well, these are great questions. I was gonna say, I wish my students could be here, but they are mostly here. This is great. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is great. And those that aren't here, well, you better be listening to this over the web, okay? Um, uh, I don't know where you want. Certain ones are missing in action. Um, okay, um, hope they're watching live. <laughs> Is that you? Um, okay, uh, okay, so between observations, they just, they just move forward. I, I would note that they move forward in a way that's affected by stochastics, okay? So um, the particles in these, in these models we're, we're dealing with a model that has to have stochastics. It does not make sense to apply particle filtering unless the model has some variability. And um, 
model particles need some variability, so if they're cloned due to resampling, they'll diverge in their expectations. There needs to be a humility on the part of the model. The model needs to accommodate, there's a wide variety of potential things going on. And stochastics are one of the main ways we, we accomplish that, okay? So to give this model requisite humility, to make it be a humble model. Um, and, uh, and as I said, weights are, weights are changed there. Um, okay, and at observations, this is where this weight gets updated according to how well it, it, it accords, okay? So at observations, um, the model estimates of state are corrected by empirical data, corrected in the sense that, that you know, particles are disciplined according to that data. If, if, they're, if they're good, they're upweighted. If, if they're, they're bad, um, they're, they're downweighted, okay? And at a conceptual level, what this is doing is it's going from a prior distribution to a posterior distribution. Prior, we have, we have some distribution just prior to the observation that where each model posits what's going on. And then we incorporate these, this new evidence in the form of one or more arriving uh, observations. And, and we update it to a posterior distribution. That's what's happening here when we adjust the weights. And you may say, well, wait, we have to adjust more than the weights. No, no pun intended. But, um, uh, but the fact is that um, that is sufficient because we're using sequential importance sampling. Um, so we have some estimate of model state just before it, and then the posterior is the model state uh, just after it, reflecting the fact that the distribution, it's not the particles themselves that form the distribution. It's the particles with their weights. The distribution is picking like a thousand particles, is generated by picking many, many, many particles with the probability according to their weights. It's not that the particles themselves captured the distribution in and of themselves without considering their weights. It's because of their weights, the ones that are higher weight are more widely represented. Okay, um, so I had said yesterday, and I'm not gonna go into the mathematics of this closely, but I had said yesterday that um, in general we can't, there's no mechanism to easily draw from a distribution of the current value of the model, that's what this is, um, in light of all the past evidence we've gotten, all the past observations in the previous state. So instead we use this thing called important sampling, which is why we have these weights we're dragging around, okay? Um, and um, basically uh, there's, there's some mathematical underpinnings in here, which I provided in a separate set of slides, which those who are most interested, if they wanna go through, it's laid out um, about as clearly as I can, what's going on mathematically. It's quite gnarly. There's some good references. Uh, the, the review of particle filtering by Arupalam, I, I'm quite partial to the work of uh, the, Kevin Murphy's description and his uh, machine learning uh, probabilistic introduction is also very good. But basically, um, I'm trying to provide the intuition of it here. Um, now, here we are trying to sample at the current time, what's the underlying state in light of all the evidence we've seen and, and what we have had going on, this is, says minus one, but it's, it's what we've had going on at, at previous times just after the last observation, given that we've evolved it. Now, this is an important point that I'm gonna come back to in a big way, particle MCMC. Ladies and gentlemen, particle filtering that you saw yesterday, wonderfully described by Xavier, and by Anahita, that particle filtering um, that you described, it was characterized as inferring at the current time what's the distribution of values of the model. And that's a good way to look at it. But there's a better way yet. There's a, there's a, a, a more powerful thing yet. We can view particle filtering actually as allowing us to not just sample what's going on right now, or what was going on at that earlier time, giving all the data we knew to that time. Rather, just like with HMMs, do you remember with HMMs I argued that with the forward-backward algorithm, we actually, if, if, if we're, if we've only seen data to the current point, we ask what state is the system in, 
we, we can get some insight. We can have a certain probability associated with being in each state. Okay. Um, but what's more powerful yet is later, if we retrospectively look back till now, we can actually get a better understanding of where we are at this current time. So if I consider only the data till now, I can get a pretty good guess as to where I might be in different states with the HMM. But if where I am right now is something I, I know the time, and say a day from now I look back, I'll have an even better idea of where I am because of something that's happened between now and then. What is that thing? What is that thing that allows me to retroactively, retrospectively have greater clarity about where I am at this moment in time? Um, what, what, what changes between now and then that allows me to infer where I am now from that later perspective allows it to be even more, more clear than what's the case now. I'm not expressing this well. If I asked, what time is it? Tw let's say 10.30. Given all the data I've observed till now, I might infer what my underlying state is right now. You know, sane or not sane, <laughs> right? Right? But if, oh, say at the end of, <laughs> end of the week, um, I would argue that I can, I can retrospectively have an even better understanding of the probability of me being sane or uns insane right now than I can right now. So if I were to look back from Friday and say, Friday night and say, was I sane as of 10.30 on Wednesday? And attach a probability to that. Uh, so Christine has a very strong opinion on the matter. Yes. I don't think we can do it retrospectively, do we? I think we can kind of get that from our baseline. Well, retrospectively, there's something that we're going to know on Friday that we don't know now. What is it? <laughs> what is it? I'm putting myself in a box here. We're going to have further observations that have taken place by Friday. And I would argue, you may have. You may remember, I argued this with his markup models, that it's not just what's happened till now, but what's going to happen that will shed light on my underlying state now. <laughs> I can give graphical examples of this, but, uh, but I'll, I'll let it you know, rest in your imagination. The point is that what you observe after this point can be useful to judge what was the likely state of the system at this point. I argued yesterday that um, with an HMM, for example, we may have an HMM which involves um, knowing something about, for example, whether someone's driving or not. Remember that example? And I argued that you could use a given data point at a given point, right? You could say, well, what's their GPS speed as measured by their phone, which is one of the things that, that picks up what's their GPS speed. We can ask what's their GPS speed right now to know if they're driving right now, but that's awfully limited. Because it's noisy, it, it varies up and down, they could be at a stoplight, they're still in a vehicle, but it's not going to tell you that. And what I argued is that with an HMM, we take into account not just the observation now, but surrounding observations. Observations a bit earlier, a bit later. More than that, we take into account the underlying process, its rate of change, the fact that I don't start driving and stop driving every millisecond. You know, if I drive, I tend to drive for some period of time, at least a couple minutes at a time. Um, if I'm not driving, you know, uh, you know, often I go in a not driving state for uh, many hours or days at a time. Um, so the point is that with hidden Markov models, we're not just using the observation right now to judge the situation right now. We're using other observations and other knowledge from nearby times. So for example, right now, maybe my GPS speed is, is as measured by my GPS device but on Ethica, it's, it's five uh, kilometers an hour. And you might say, well, maybe he's biking, maybe he's walking. Um, um, maybe it's a noisy GPS signal. Um, uh, maybe he's driving and it's just this anomalous he loves. It's very ambiguous. But if you knew with great confidence that, you know, uh, in another five minutes my speed is, is 100 kilometers an hour and if 
five minutes ago it was 50 kilometers an hour. You might say, okay, he's probably in a vehicle. It's just that, and you know, similarly, if it was for the next hour I'm driving, and then for the past half hour I'm clearly driving in the sense that it's, it's, it's very high readings uh, there, very likely I'm driving there. Probably it means I'm driving now. It's just, you know, I was probably at a stoplight or pulled over on the side of the road to, to check the directions or whatever. So the point is that we use insights from other nearby times to shed light on this. And so it is with, with uh, particle filters. So instead of just using the data to this point to judge what's going on now, we can use data collected after this point retrospectively to know what's going on now. And the way in which we do this is similar with HMMs. Ladies and gentlemen, with HMMs, we derive the most likely single trajectory that explains the data. That was the Viterbi algorithm. And here, with particle filters, we can sample from trajectories, not just sample at the current time what's going on, have a distribution, uh, this is the number of people susceptible right now, a distribution over that, and a distribution of the number of infectives. We can actually sample from trajectories. So here, we're not, we're, we're sampling from entire sequences. So this particle posits there were this many people susceptible originally in the model, and then it declined to that, and then it rose, and then it went down again, and the number of infected people. Each particle can tell a complete story. Each sampled value is a story. We're sampling stories about what's happened over the entire time frame with this. We're not sampling right now what is the situation alone. We're not just sampling right now in light of past data. We're actually sampling, given everything we know from the start to the finish, what was likely the case at these earlier times? When did this offender first likely develop antisocial intent? When did this individual likely develop concrete suicidal ideation? Take into account not just the data to that point, but the data that's come out since then. That was probably the first indication that Donald Trump was off his rocker. <laughs> right? Um, okay. So, so ladies and gentlemen, um, we have these dynamics at observations, uh, and uh, in in many cases we are seeking to sample what's going on right now, but sometimes we're going to sample from trajectories, and that will, that will be a big theme within particle MCMC. Okay, so I talked yesterday about um, important sampling. Um, uh, I think I'm going to go, uh, go light on this, but on the mathematics, but here when it comes to this idea, we have a prior distribution just prior to the observation. We, we have a certain hypothesis about what's going on. And then after the observation, our hypothesis is different. Okay? Um, so when a new data point comes in, the way in which we accomplish that is by updating the weights associated with each particle to reflect how well it matches the empirical data, this new piece of empirical data. There's many ways of updating the weights that are explored in the particle filtering literature. But we make use of a particular simple strategy that's called the condensation algorithm in the machine learning literature. It actually goes by a different name in the, in the um, uh, computational status literature. And um, basically what this involves is this process I've been talking about. Rather than needing to update the weights at all times, they're only updated just prior to the, to the distribution, okay? So here, at a technical level, what's happening is we're making the proposal distribution be the prior distribution. That's, that's what it is called technically. And it turns out that it's very, very um, simplifying if we do that. I'm not gonna go into that, but the proposal distribution is the, the uh, prior distribution here, which is just the distribution induced by, um, uh, by the model based on running the model forward from the last data point. So more sophisticated schemes would actually not just take the model 
uh, weights as they were at the last after the last observation and run it forward, having the particles evolve by keeping the weights the same. They would have the weights evolving all along the way as well, which is more sophisticated. It, it would anticipate coming observations and so on. Turns out, for nonlinear models, it's not clear to me that's possible. It's not clear to me that that would be fruitful or possible. Um, but basically what's going to happen here is at a new observation, when a new observation comes in, we're going to compute the likelihood of observing that new observation for each particle, which has a complete state, has an understanding, a hypothesis, but the complete state of the system. We're going to ask, what's the likelihood that we would observe this new data this new empirical data in light of that underlying state posited by the particle. And once we compute that likelihood, we do something very simple. We multiply the current weight of the particle by that value of that likelihood function. So if the likelihood is really high, the weight will grow by a lot. Let's suppose the likelihood is very, 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 very high for it. Um, it will expand the weight of that particle. If the likelihood is very, very low, close to zero, it will contract the weight of that particle, make it, make it uh, much smaller than it previously was. Okay? So we're basically multiplying by the likelihood function. Okay? That's what this is. The, current, the weight at time t is just equal to the weight at time t minus 1 times this. This is the likelihood function. Likelihood, I'll observe this new data point in light of my current model state for this particle. The, da the data from the world is not specific to particle, but the current state is. So for each particle, it has some current weight, uh, this, this weight here, and we are going to take that weight and multiply. What's the likelihood we would have observed this data given what this particle believes is the case? It's, it's, um, uh, it's uh, estimate of the current state, and that gives us the new weight. Okay? So that weight will tend to be larger if this likelihood is high than it was before, and it will tend to be smaller than it was before if this likelihood is low. So this is sort of what rewards or punishes a particle for being on base or, or off base. Okay, so this is the likelihood. I don't expect you to know this math, but that's basically what's happened. And that's why, if probably we could look at uh, Xiaoyan's model, and I could probably go find that function. Um, uh, so, uh, okay, and uh, where is the weight update? Xiaoyan, can you... Um, Update, there it is. I, in fact, I know that name. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, in this case, Xiao Yan is actually updating the weights, and uh, I'm, I'd have to go find it. Ah, here it is. There it is. It's a thing of beauty. Look at that. Well, okay. Um, no one, again, there doesn't seem to be. Uh, uh, a riot, but uh, the, the significance of this will, will sink in. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly the embodiment of that rule. We have some prior weight, and we multiply it times the likelihood, given the, the particle state, to get the posterior weight. That's exactly what I'm talking about doing here. This is the prior weight. This is the likelihood, and we get the posterior weight. So particles that are good particles, that predict well, that predict the empirical data well, make it very likely we would have in seen this um, uh, empirical data. Those have their weight increased, and those particles that make it very, uh, that, that posit a view of the world that makes it very unlikely we would have observed this data those are, are downweighted and, and uh, they, they find their weight decreasing a lot. Okay? So the likelihood here expressed is the likelihood of observing some empirical data in light of model state as posited by that particle. This is really what it should say of, of, 
particle posited model state. Okay. Um, now, as I said, in the condensation algorithm, um, uh, we we only update this way at a time of a new observation. Um, and I've noted particle filter is the survival of the fittest. There are these different hypotheses for what's going on in the model, what the value of parameters are, what the value of the underlying state is that compete. And there's the survival of the fittest. Well, the likelihood function is dictates what fit means. What it means to be fit is, well, it accords with the weights. Now, and because of that, the choice of one or more likelihood functions is one of the most important things that the important choices you make in building these models. Now we've explored several likelihood functions in the course of our models. Um, the main ones have been, are listed here. Um, early on we worked with the binomial one and that turned out it was very simple. The idea was look, um, for example, we have empirical data on, um, new, in, uh, on new infections per week maybe. And we posit that that um, the model posits a, a certain number of total people who are infected or, or newly infected. And we say, well, let's suppose that each of those newly infected people has a certain probability being reported. And we said, okay, um, in that case, uh, we're going to have a binomial likelihood function in the sense that the likelihood of seeing n cases reported given m cases that truly have the infection should be binomially distributed. Uh, each case has a certain probability p of being reported and we just, you know, uh, we just flip the coin for each one. We total up the number that are recorded. That's what we viewed um, uh, the situation as being comparable to. And so we used what's called binomial one. So um, here, it, we, we get it's sort of the number of coin flips that turn out heads um, when you have a, a coin that may be uh, uh, that have a certain probability of turning out heads. The problem is that it, um, it can give zero likelihood if all particles posit values that, that, are, that are incompatible um, uh, with uh, the number of, of observations. So, if all particles um, posit a fewer number of people that are actually affected than the observed value, uh, the, the value of the observed value, there's zero chance for any of them that with you know, fewer than 100 people actually ill, that you'd actually have 100 people reported as ill. The, the binomial assumes each person has a certain probability of reporting ill. Uh, and the actual reported number is just it's just the result of a bunch of coin flips, essentially, um, for each person as to whether they get reported or not. But if there's fewer than 100 people, fewer than 100 coin flips occurring, fewer than 100 people sick, there's no way you're going to get, say, 100, 100 heads in that. And, and what this means is all particles will be associated with the likelihood of zero, and that causes that causes problems with the particle filtering algorithm when it comes to so-called renormalizing the weights of the particles. The particles' weights have to sum to one, and if all of them are zero, they can't sum to one. So to replace that, we went with a negative binomial distribution, and that's what uh, Shao Ye and what Anahita used yesterday was the negative binomial. It's been our workhorse. We actually adopted this from another paper in the literature on MCMC. Uh, they used a negative binomial distribution and I realized why. It was, it was, it was a great choice. Okay? So we've used this and, and uh, it, it basically does not give a zero weight if, um, uh, if the number of, of, of uh, infected is larger than the number of um, um, the number than the than the excuse me the number of infectives is less uh, true infectives in the model is less than the observed one so in a way it, it, you can imagine it allowing for false false positives for example we have also used a normal distribution I think Tina has used normal distributions for her likelihoods at times working with biomedical data for HIV related uh, data 
Okay. Um, now, one important thing about the likelihood function is there's often a need to think about how tight you want it to be. How, how harsh do you want the likelihood function to be? How unforgiving? And with a negative binomial, there's something called the dispersion parameter, which I won't go into, but basically it, it dictates how wide this distribution is. And you can pick for the same mean a dispersion parameter, which you can kind of think of it like for a normal distribution, you have the mean and then you have standard deviation, right? And a wider standard deviation will lead to a wider, uh, a wider distribution, which here would be more accommodating. Um, and so it is with the dispersion parameter. It will be, it'll be less harshly judgmental of something that's off base, because it still might give it a pretty high weight, even though it's some distance out from what you expected. So the dispersion parameter uh, serves a similar role with negative binomial. It's a measure of dispersion at a, at a level. And, and here's the dispersion parameter of one. I'm going to show you for the same mean as we vary the dispersion parameter, how this changes. This is, this is a mean of 1,000. The mean is right down here. But the dispersion parameter is 1, so it's quite broad. You could have the single most likely areas between 0 and 500, even though the mean is 1,000, and it can reach out into the thousands. Watch this, dispersion parameter 2. The mean is still 1,000, but you'll notice the chance of falling between 2,500 and 3,000 here is smaller than it is here. We continue to go up. Look between 2,500 and 3,000, smaller yet. Dispersion parameter 4, 8. Look at that. Almost no chance of falling in this range. Very little chance of falling between 0 and 500 compared to the, or, or comparatively little. Um, going tighter and tighter about this, right? So as you increase this dispersion parameter, it becomes more, more uh, particular about matching closely. It becomes less accommodating, okay? So um, we typically have to tune this dispersion parameter. Um, and we pick a dispersion parameter that gives the model, makes the model humble, so it's not overconfident, but we don't want it so big that the model is clueless and just ex loosey-goosey and accepts for anything. We have this balance between having the model be strict enough to get up to, to, to discipline its, its wayward particles and, and keep it, keep them on the straight and narrow, but not, not so demanding that it's unrealistic and that it's overly confident about its own interpretation. Because remember, um, the particles have, they posit things about the world, and we want a requisite variety of what they posit to allow it to adapt. We also want them to be able to not, um, to be able to recognize that, okay, some particles are doing better than others, rather than to essentially treat any particle way out here as, as hopeless. And uh, we want to reward particles that are closer to this. And sometimes having a wider distribution will allow that, okay? Okay, now often we'll have multiple types of, dis of observations. Xiao Yan yesterday had um, two types of observations. Um, one was yearly observations, which included age groups, and one was monthly observations, which were aggregate in character. Anahita had two types of observations. One was from clinical data, one was from online search results, um, search volumes. If we have multiple types of data, we frequently deal with them by just multiplying the likelihood functions for each one. You could criticize that. Probably should be criticized. I, I'm looking for people to advance it, to have a better way of handling it. But right now, that's what we do for most of the cases. Hasn't seemed to hurt us badly, but there's probably better ways of doing with it. For example, having joint likelihood functions, et cetera. But, um, but right now, when we have multiple likelihood functions, if we have both types of data, we tend to multiply them, okay? If you have data arriving at different frequencies, um, it gets some, somewhat more uh, involved, um, but uh, uh, basically you may want to consider 
not punishing those that, that arrive only infrequently in terms of their significance um, by design of a likelihood function. Um, okay, now, this is a point of great significance to Luce's work. Particle filtering, as described, is incremental in nature. The technical term for it in computational stats is it's recursive, meaning when a new data point comes in, we do not have to go back and reconsider all previous data points and do some big computation involving them. All we do is we multiply the existing weight, which has incorporated knowledge of all those past data points, by the likelihood function applied to the new data point. And we're, we're done. It's a very incremental thing. It's not that we have to cast back and consider all the past information. It's rather the results of all that processing on past operations gave us a weight that all we have to do is multiply according to this newest observation. It's incremental in the sense that we don't have to redo all our work when this new data point comes in. We just update the results of our earlier work. Okay. Um, now, this makes it almost ideal for, I mean, it, it, it's, it's like perfect fit, hand and glove fit, given the weather. Um, for, uh, for the types of solutions Luce is, is applying, which is streaming solutions. Each new data point comes in, we handle it. We don't even have to keep around the old data points. We don't have to go back and get them out of a database and consider them all and balance them in our calculations. No, they're, they're done, they're in the past. We've already considered them. Our, our current results have incorporated the knowledge of them. Our model has been informed by them. All we have to do is consider this new data point in a very lightweight sort of way, and we step it forward. And that's what Luce's solution brilliantly has incorporated, okay? Um, I noted before when the, the resampling step, I won't belabor it, um, but uh, basically if particles are skewed too much, too heavily, if we have a lot of really low weight particles and then some high weight, we, we don't want have our particle, most of our particles keeping around really low plausibility hypotheses. So we weed out the low weight ones and, and through this resampling step and reward the ones which are which are a higher weight. Okay? Okay. Um, now, this is a very important point. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my one of my students who worked with me on particle filtering um, uh, was was uh, uh, was not aware, he, he, because he didn't understand the basis of particle filtering, um, he made the rookie mistake of computing some statistics, like the means, for example, or others, using the value of particles. He would just take all the particles and take the mean over all the particles, or, or take the standard deviation of all the particles, or take some function, you know, ask what, what What's the probability that we'll have, we have more than a certain number of people infected you take at a certain time, you would take all the particles at that time and ask what fraction of them were above that level. That is a meaningless computation because it fails to take into account perhaps the defining feature of this method, which is, or a defining feature, which is the presence of these weights. It is not meaningful to just process all the particles, treat them as equals. What you have to consider is their weight. Because a particle with a big weight is not the same as a particle with a small weight. A particle with a big weight needs to be considered much more, um, it's much more prevalent than what with a small weight. So instead of doing calculations on the particles in an undifferentiated fashion, we do so by sampling the particles. In other words, we draw from the particles according to their weights. We, we pick each one according to the weight. And it turns out this is really easy to do. Computers know how to do this really well, easily. It's um, the example I like to give to my students. I, sometime I'll have to have a nice set of props for this. But if I had you know, three different things of different length here, 
So imagine the length of each of these is their weight, right? Oh, that sounds that sounds like a dimensional inconsistency, but, but it's not. And maybe I'll consider this the length just to, to keep it varied, okay? So I have three things at different lengths. Um, it's really easy to pick with these according to their so wait, as long as I can pick uniformly, I'll just pick uniformly in space and say, okay, I got that one. Okay, I, I got got this one, you know, got this one again. Basically, as long as I can pick uniformly between something here, I can figure out which um, I can get this distribution according to their weights by picking a bunch uniformly and figuring out which one falls under it. It's a very nice little algorithm, if I might say so myself. Um, I guess Jeff would like to see that one illustrated in a more animated fashion. Um, okay, so when we want to measure something, when we want to say, you know, uh, what, uh, what is the probability this intervention yields a bigger gain than that one? Or what is the probability that we will have um, a suicide uh, occur in this case according to, to the model. And we have these different particles that have been computed. We, we need to sample from the particles and ask, for example, what fraction of them led to that you know, suicide attempt, for example. Or what fraction of them, of the particles um, considered for uh, projecting these interventions had, had one intervention above the other, or what have you. So, so here, we are always drawing samples from the weighted particles in those diagrams that Xiaoyan showed and the diagrams that Anahita showed were therefore sampled from the particles rather than showing all particles. It's not meaningful to talk about all particles because we're dealing, we want to deal with the distribution over the particles as implied by the weights. That's because of important sampling. Okay, I had said yesterday um, that when it comes to models, we have to be, to run the balance between a model that's overconfident and underconfident. We don't want a model that has too much hubris because it will proudly adhere to its view of the world no matter what evidence comes out. And it'll be stubborn, obstinate, truculent, and unable to effectively incorporate new information it will probably end up in a bad way because models left to their own devices tend not to be accurate. The example I gave yesterday was trying to walk home from your office with your eyes closed. Even the best model will end up in a bad way. Okay? We, we need the model to consider new evidence. Just like on our way home, we need to be able to peek and see where we are, at least occasionally, to correct our path. At the same time, we don't want a model that's underconfident, that has no clue, that says, I don't know anything about what's going on. I know nothing. You know, um, you don't want a model that, that is so uh, epistemically um, sort of hopeless that it, it just says, you know, I have no clue about anything in the world, and I don't know what's going to happen. And as soon as the empirical data is, 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 you know, is no longer available, um, I will assume anything is possible. That's not really realistic either. The world is a structured place. There's regularities in the world. There's an orderliness of the world that models should capture. And we want a model that's not overconfident in that, in its understanding of the world, but we also don't want, want one that, that just has no, no sense of those regularities. So here we are trying to balance in our model between these, uh, these two elements. Um, so we have to, we have to uh, balance this. And there's basically two ways that we, um, uh, that we end up accomplishing this. Um, one is we have likelihood functions that are wide or narrow. So we can broaden our likelihood function or make it narrow. We can make the model more demanding in terms of what it judges to be an adequate math match to the observed data or, or less demand. Secondly, we can introduce stochastics into the model. Okay? Now, this is an important point, and it relates to some things Jeff was mentioning yesterday and came out of that discussion. 
There's sometimes stochastics we build into the model to simplify our model scope and we say we're going to exclude this from the model scope and we'll just approximate it as stochastic for, for now. Um, but in particle filter models, a lot of the reasons we put in stochastics is to keep the model humble, to give it a requisite degree of accommodation for a variety of possible outcomes. We try to keep it open to data and able to match data. If it's really narrow, if we have very little stochastics, it will have a very narrow band of expectation. If a new data point comes in that's further away from that, it can't easily adapt to it. It's, it's too vested in this sort of uh, current, um, current area where, uh, of, of its expectations. Whereas if we have, a, if we have a, quite a bit of stochastics, it will give it this sort of breadth, which will let it adapt to new data coming in. And so Anahita and Xiaoyan have spent a great deal of time adapting models so they have that right balance of requisite variety, um, but also not being hopelessly uncertain once data stops coming in. And this is what yields some of the considerations Xiaoyan cited with, uh, with respect to looking forward. So Xiaoyan noted that her model um, for, say, measles, I think, can look forward, what, six months to a year, sometimes a little bit more? Um, yeah, yeah, sometimes two years. Sometimes two years. And you might say, well, we can do better than that. Well, we'll you know, uh, make it less uncertain by restricting the stochastics. But the problem there is, that will prevent it from being able to easily adapt to new data points uh, as, as easily. And it may lead the model to hewing to an understanding, uh, obstinately having a sort of prideful um, hewing to, I think this is the case, and it won't adapt, uh, and it won't match better then either, because it will just be off in a biased way. It will be biased in its outcome. So there's this, there's this need to limit model bias by introducing requisite varieties stochastically, have some variability in results, but not so much variability that it quickly doesn't know within a month or two, it has no clue of what's going to happen. Okay? So, so stochastics are one of these things we tune. It's not a matter that we have to tune tons of things. We end up tuning... Um, uh, often just uh, two or three parameters, but uh, Xiaoyan could talk with you about parameters she's tuned, but basically it's associated with the random walks, and then maybe you adjust the, uh, the width of the likelihood function. Okay, um, there's some dangers which apply with particle filtering models. Um, too few particles, if you don't have enough particles, it'll look, as I said, sclerotic, it'll look kind of oddly um, impoverished um, and there's actually something called particle impoverishment where they become too similar and it's all one group think in the model um, and uh, there is a risk that um, uh, the condensation algorithm may sometimes grow too naive we haven't we haven't seen much of it okay um, so one thing I will just note, we've done some evaluations of particle filtering against synthetic ground truth. Those have suggested that even with more complicated underlying models, it does a quite a good job inferring what's going on. Um, in terms of inferring the underlying situation, we use an ABM to test it, an ABM that's more complex than the particle filtered model. Okay, a few points of learning. Particle filtering is powerful in general. Particle filtering is an extraordinary method. Particle filtering has been very successful across a wide variety of projects that we've undertaken. Uh, it has really opened up new avenues for practical application of modeling in light of rich data sources. And it's a far cry better for calibration because of the ability to reground latent state for many models. Okay. 
Okay. Um, it's not to say we don't do calibration at all. In fact, we do quite a lot. Like uh, uh, Yang Chen, who's uh, who, who is somewhere in the room. Um, uh, Yang Chen uh, has has done a great deal of work with uh, calibration recently to good effect. Um, Choice of likelihood function is very important. Choose your likelihoods carefully. And what things are stochastic and how stochastic is, is an important balance. I would suggest partnering up with someone who's, who's done it before. Anahita and uh, Xiao Yan are, are two uh, core people, but several others in the group have also done it. Um, and uh, and you, know, you need to tune model confidence is a lot of it. Um, uh, tuning mo uh, probabilistic model parameters makes a d big difference for the accuracy of the particle filtering. Um, and if the likelihood is too diffuse, if it's too broad, particle filtering will often not help much. We have had, we have, uh, so our work with particle filtering has not been without its challenges. I think uh, Refot's work with it for suicide, very encouraging. We'll be talking about that in a bit. Some of the work we've done with uh, opioids, actually particle MCMC, very, very encouraging. The work with measles, the work with chickenpox, work with TB, um, work with pertussis, um, all very, uh, very, very encouraging. And I can, I can list more that are very encouraging. We have had a few challenges with it. Um, there was uh, a model of West Nile that we tried taking on early on. Um, which uh, West Nile virus, which uh, had some challenges in terms of overconfidence versus underconfidence. And that one needs revisiting. Um, the likelihoods were very broad there, and in retrospect, we probably could have made them narrower. But we, we didn't really get, we got some improvement out, but it was less than we would have liked uh, in terms of, of extra insights. Um, uh, Tina's model, Tina has worked with a model of HIV and particle filtering, uh, where the story is not yet fully written. Um, and uh, what's going on there seems to be, my best reading of it, is that the particle filtering is struggling with the fact that the model does not have the requisite flexibility to capture some of the things in, in, with the particular HIV drugs being used in the world. And so it is having difficulty squaring a more constrained, a, a sort of overly narrow model scope with, with data that requires more, um, more factors to, to fully capture it. And she is, um, she is finding challenges getting it to, to kind of uh, fully, fully match that data. As I say, the story is not yet written, um, but I think it, it may be an indication that the model needs to be expanded to enhance the, the repertoire of what's in there. This is a little bit related to Terry's question yesterday, that how do we know that if I could, if I could give my take home from it, how do we avoid particle filter and make us too complacent by just allowing us to take a low quality model and just match it, you know, and, and correct it so much that we don't feel the, the need to improve it. And uh, Tina's model is, is an example of, of how it keeps on poking you to improve it. Okay. Um, uh, right. Um, Okay, uh, so particle filtering uh, is a fantastic method. It could take many lines of evidence and give a picture of what's going on in the underlying system, how it evolves. Uh, it continually regrounds model state, given evidence from the latest data, and in fact can allow you to reconstruct not just current model state, but the history of state, take into account um, both data to a certain point and after that point. It's very well suited to work with some public health data streams and models. Um, uh, in the presence of aggregate dynamic data, particle filtering with aggregate models can perform well. 
Particle filtering with agent-based models is something that I'll be talking about. And it's one of our prime future lines of real effort. My own observation is that particle filtering with agent-based models probably needs at least some individual level information to work well. It, trying to do it with purely aggregate information is still too ambiguous. You don't know which agent is responsible for the, uh, uh, the aggregate observations, etc. Particle filtering is not a turn the crank process. It involves iteration and learning. Um, it involves careful working with the model and learning from a model. Um, and research progress is really required to, um, to improve support for particle filtering and explore um, applications in more advanced areas uh, such as PM, CMC to domains. Okay, so those, that was some further comments on particle filtering. Um, I think that's as far as we will try to take the introduction to particle filtering. I will note that on the site, um, uh, whilst this boot camp has been uh, proceeding, I have placed additional support resources. Um, so in the lecture slides, there is a additional, um, uh, additional uh, set of slides associated with underlying theory for particle filtering, as I, as I recall. Maybe it's in the elective, yes. Elective, there it is. Thank you, thank you. Um, this provides a very mathematical walkthrough of particle filtering, where I try to knit together the understanding that gives rise to it. Okay, uh, mumble. Um, uh, I won't do that now. Um, but it gives, uh, it gives a more systematic walkthrough of the mathematics behind particle filtering for anyone that's needed. I think what we'll do now is uh, if we're up to it, we could have a particle filtering presentation. Is that okay? Um, Rifat, are you feeling up to giving your presentation? No. Is that? No. <laughs> <laughs> ask me to. Uh -oh. <laughs> you can ask, well, you can ask Xiao Yan, uh, are you feeling up to giving a joint presentation? Uh, I mean, a joint, sorry, a chicken pox uh, measles? Yes. Just so you know, you only have 15 minutes. Yeah, left. yeah, that's what I'm. Okay. I, I'm figuring for them that will be a welcome. Okay. Well, I can measure that later as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, uh, Shao Yan, are you feeling up to doing that? And yeah. And, yeah. Okay, that's great. And then. Uh, poor Shai Yen's daughter is feeling sick today, and so it's possible she'll have to leave us this afternoon. So this would let her get that out of the way. Yeah. 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 I suspect that Rebot might have a certain measure of gratitude she'll offer to him. <laughs> okay, so do you want to come up here and present from your your um, uh, your laptop? Great, thank you. Yeah, and this doesn't have to be long. Um, uh, so.